Today, we're going to make a simple carriage lock for the lathe. And as usual, we're going to massively overcomplicate it using a 3D scanner. Welcome back to Cloud42. I'm James. One of my patrons named Joe shared some photos of upgrades that he made to his Grizzly Geo 602 lathe and suggested that I might want to make some of the same upgrades to my lathe and maybe make videos about them for the channel. One of the photos he shared is a carriage locking knob that uses a roller thrust bearing. The knob allows him to lock the carriage without tools and the thrust bearing means that relatively light hand pressure can generate a lot of clamping force. This seems like the perfect excuse to try out my new 3D scanner to scan the lathe and assist with the CAD modeling. If you haven't seen it, Superfast Matt published a video a few weeks ago saying that everyone should now have a 3D scanner in their toolbox. So I bought one because I always do everything that Matt says. All hail the algorithm. This is the scanner I bought. This is the Einstar from Shining 3D. I think it's really cute and optimistic the way they put a manual in the package. We'll put this aside and pull it out if we can't make it work any other way. The scanner itself is intended to be used handheld, but if you look back here under the boot, there is a quarter 20 thread under a little cover, so you can mount it on a tripod if you need to. The scanner on the front has a pair of stereo cameras for reconstructing the 3D data, and then it has a third camera for picking up color and texture information, as well as infrared illumination here in the center. On the back side of the scanner, there are buttons to change the brightness and the zoom level and some indicator lights to indicate how the scanning is going, if you're too close or too far away. And the connector for the cable is on the bottom. I like that this isn't a normal USB connector. This is some kind of industrial uh, collar lock connector. It's actually pretty cool. I like stuff like this. So the one combined cable has both power and USB. So there's USB on the end to go into the computer and a separate power jack to take power from the included power adapter. And this thing takes quite a bit of power, generates quite a bit of heat. There are fans in it that are blowing air through it. So you definitely need the external power to power. You're just not gonna get that from your laptop. And speaking of laptops, I did buy a new laptop specifically to run this. They have system requirements on their website, and if you look, it requires a significant CPU and an even more significant graphics card to run properly. This particular machine is probably overkill, but it's got plenty of CPU and GPU to run this, and I've got power to spare for future applications. The reason I bought this particular machine is not only because it's got like a 26 core CPU and a sizable NVIDIA graphics card in it, but also because it doesn't look completely stupid like it was designed by a 12 year old who's watched too much anime. The carriage lock on this lathe is just an M6 socket head cap screw that comes down to a little clamping bar under here that rides on the underside of the ways. So you can just take a, a five millimeter wrench, lock it down, it locks the carriage and use the same wrench to unlock it. I don't really wanna have a wrench laying around here, so I'd like to put something on here. I've seen people put on a lever, so you just give it a little quarter turn flick, but there's not a lot of room in here, so you really only have about a quarter of a turn to work with, and I find that this thing is spongy enough that I can't lock and unlock it reliably that way. I'd rather have a knob on here so I can get multiple turns to make this work properly. The other thing we have here is the scale for the DRO that's going to overlap where the knob needs to go. So there's a limited amount of space here and I want to make sure that we have enough clearance. So that's part of the reason why I want to use a 3D scan for doing the CAD modeling. Now I'm not planning on using any matte scanning spray or anything. So I'm expecting that this hole is going to be hard to locate accurately and that the scanner is not going to get really great dimensions, at least down inside the hole. So I'm gonna go ahead and measure this with a caliper and a pin and just try to get the dimensions for it so that the scan can help me figure out where it needs to be, but I have the actual dimensions of the hole so that I can make the parts that need to fit precisely into that hole. I will wipe the lathe down, try to get all the chips off of it and get the surfaces clean so that I can get the best scanning results possible, even though I'm not gonna be using a matte spray. We'll create a new project here inside of the software and choose our parameters. We are going to be scanning an object and I've selected medium to large and I want to do the alignment based on features 
There's not a lot of texture here. I'm not planning on using markers. And then we'll set the scan accuracy to 0.2 millimeters. That's going to generate a lot of data. We'll see how it goes. And then it's just a matter of starting the scan and waving the scanner back and forth over the machine. In the upper left corner of the screen there, you can see the image that it's getting. You can see what the camera is returning and there's a little bit of red highlighting on the brightest parts of the image. That's a guide to help you set the brightness on the scanner. And then in the center, you can see the geometry that you're scanning. So the idea is to move back and forth with the scanner at different angles, getting different views so that it can reconstruct the geometry. The colors here in this view indicate the data quality. Green means it has good solid data. Red means it has only approximate data. And so the idea is to go back and forth over the same areas from different angles until you have good green data everywhere that you need it. And you can see that the scanner occasionally does lose the tracking. And what's happening there is I am not getting enough 3D information in the view of the scanner for it to figure out where it is in space relative to what's already been scanned. And so when that happens, I just move the scanner back into an area that's already been scanned, let it sync up again, and it will pick up from where it left off. And it's done a pretty good job of resyncing. Most of the time, what I was doing was getting too close to the object, so there just wasn't enough in view for it to keep track of where it was. So at this point, I've got green data everywhere that I think I'm going to need it. The area here where the lock is going to go looks to be pretty well defined. There's some stuff outside of that that isn't well defined and there's a whole bunch of garbage data that we really don't need for this process. And I really want to delete that because it's just going to take up CPU power and make the CAD software run slow. So I can just rubber band around all of the points that I don't need and I can just delete them. I'll try to leave enough here for context and positioning and try to clean up the model so I've got the stuff I need without anything that I really don't and then we can generate the point cloud. This took about a minute on a model of this size with, you know, again, a sizable CPU and GPU, but that's not too bad. And the result is a nice point cloud with some color and texture information. You can even read the threading table on the front of the apron, which is pretty impressive to me. Next step is to mesh the model, and this will turn it into a mesh like an STL, or in this case, an OBJ file. And we have some simplification options. I'm not trying to make a watertight model because I didn't scan all sides of this thing. I'm not going to do any filtering. I do want to remove some small floating parts. And then we'll just apply this and generate our mesh. And again, this took a minute or two. And now we have an actual mesh. You can see this isn't a cloud of points anymore. This is a whole bunch of tiny triangles. Now with the mesh created, I would like to simplify it a little bit so we don't have to bring so much data into Fusion 360. So under simplification, you can see this is a 300 meg file with about four and a half million triangles in it. And I'll just drag the simplification over here. I've played with this a little bit and getting it up around 80% gets me down to about a 60 meg file with just under a million triangles. And let's try that. I think that'll probably be okay. It's certainly better than four and a half million. Before I bring this scan into the CAD software, I also need to orient it with the coordinate system. And we can do that here with the create feature option. And I'd like to create a plane and fit that to some data here in the model. So I'll just choose best fit and then zoom in and find a horizontal plane. Now these machine dovetail surfaces look like a good place to start. So I'll just highlight some data that's on this flat dovetail. The one on the other side is also at the same height, so I'll highlight some of that data and then let it fit a plane to all of those points that I've got selected. So I click Create and it will do a best fit and you can see it's created something called Plane 1. Now to orient, I also need a couple more planes. I'll get some information off the front of the lathe here and create a vertical plane. This is not gonna necessarily be perfectly perpendicular just because of the draft, but we're not gonna use it for that. You'll see here in a minute. So I'll create a second plane there, and then I'm gonna create a third plane on the right-hand side. Again, this is not necessarily vertical. To orient, we need a plane, a line, and a point. So I'll create a line between that top plane and the front plane. So I'll just select the two planes that I created, the one across the top, 
and the one on the front and this will give me a line through that intersection this will be like the x-axis in the final coordinate system and then I'll take that axis and I will create a point at the intersection between that axis and the plane on the right and that will be like the zero point of our coordinate system so I'll select the line that I just created plane 3 on the right and that will create a plane a line and a point so then I can come over here look at my features that are there and now we should be ready to move so I'll click move select 321 system movement I'll select that first horizontal plane mark that as Z positive so Z comes up out of that plane I'll choose the line and then I'll choose X positive that line is the X axis pointing to the right and then I'll choose my point that I created for the zero click move and it will snap to the coordinate system now down in the lower right corner you can see the axes X to the right Z up that looks right and as we rotate the model around we can see the origin diagram down here we can click on different parts of the box look at different sides of the model and that all looks good so now we can just click save and give this thing a name and store it out as an obj file that we can then later bring into fusion 360. of course i have to learn to type the best way i've found to bring mesh data into fusion 360 is with the insert mesh command we'll just select the file from the computer find the obj file and bring that in and when we use the insert mesh command we get this dialog where we can set the units and I'm going to set it to millimeters because I know that's what the file is I'm checking here to make sure that the coordinate system lines up and it does so orienting in the scan software appears to have worked and now we have the scan data in fusion but scan data or mesh data in fusion is not really a first class citizen you can't align anything to it you can't even select points in it so to work with this we need to move over to the mesh workspace and choose create mesh selection sketch now i'm going to select the front plane here and then we'll drag back a plane from that and it's going to create a line wherever that plane intersects the mesh so this orange line that you see here on the screen it isn't real sketch geometry but it's geometry that we can use to create sketch geometry so you can see that it created a sketch here I'll name this front section and then open up that sketch and edit it now even this orange line in the sketch isn't real sketch geometry but we can create sketch geometry from it under the create menu I'll select fit curves to mesh section in this case I want to choose a line and I'll select a couple of points on that projected curve and it will create a real sketch line that aligns with it and I'll do the same thing over here on the right hand side and now we have a couple of real line segments in the sketch that are derived from the scan data now I'm going to use those to create a rectangle I'm going to line it up with those sketch lines that we pulled from the scan data and get roughly the cross section of a piece of the apron here so that we can use that to extrude a solid model that all seems to be aligned up well so I'm going to go and do exactly the same thing on the right hand side so I'll just say create mesh selection sketch again I'll choose the in this case the YZ plane and we'll push a plane back from that and get a section line there and do exactly the same thing fit a little bit of geometry to that line so in this case I just need a line on the front and that is all I'm going to need so now I can turn off the mesh and I can see this sketch geometry I'll just select this profile I'll extrude it two directions and I'll extrude out to the line I have on the front to object select and I'll just select a point on that line and then in the other direction I'll just pull it back it doesn't really matter how far this goes I just need part of this if we turn the mesh back on we can see kind of how that lines up and this aligns pretty well and this will give me something that I can use to model against that part of the scan on the lathe you can't really model against the scan data but you can create geometry underneath it that you can use for modeling now to locate the hole I'm going to do the same thing here I'm going to offset a plane from the XY and get a section that goes around this hole 
I don't have a lot of geometry down here, so I'm just catching the very top rim of that hole. I'll edit this sketch and go in, and this time I'll fit a circle to it. I'll select this, and the system will automatically do a best fit of the circle. You can see it's showing an error of 0.158 millimeters. That's close enough, and now I have the location of that hole. So now we'll turn off the mesh, come in here, look at this body, create a sketch on the top. Now you remember that circle's a little bit below the surface here, so I'll just project that point, hit P for project, and select it, and that will give me a point on the surface of my model here. I can draw a couple of circles. I can take the dimensions that I got for the countersink and the through hole from when I use my calipers to measure the actual lathe, and this way I can get correct dimensions for those circles, hit E for extrude, and I can actually extrude the hole into this, and now I will have a model of that counterboard hole on the top of the lathe apron in my rough model of the top of the lathe apron that I have aligned with the mesh. Now if I needed to do something a lot more complicated than what I'm actually doing here, I could have spent a lot more time getting a scan of the entire lathe and even modeling out the entire geometry of the lathe, but I don't need to do that. This is going to be plenty for what I need to do here. To model the locking knob, I'll start with a model of the thrust bearing I plan to use. I just downloaded this from McMaster Car. It's a bearing and two hardened washers. I've got those positioned together, and I'll just drag those into the model of the lathe. Move this up and over so that it's closer to where I need it, and then hit J for joint select the center point on the bottom of the bearing and the top of this counter bore, and then offset that up. I think about three millimeters will be right. Click OK, and now I've got the bearing in space over the model of the lathe carriage right where I need it. And from here, it's just a matter of standard sketch and extrude modeling. We'll make a spacer, we'll bring in the screw, and then we'll model the knob around that and around the bearing. This is what I ended up with. We've got the knob up here that's pressed on. We've got the thrust bearing. We've got a plug underneath that that bears on the bottom of the counter bore. So we're not trying to bear on the top of the casting, which may not be level. Got a little space around that for clearance for the bearing to rotate. And then if we bring back the scan, we can see how this fits. It looks like we're gonna clear the ledge there on the side, and it looks like we're gonna have plenty of clearance on the top underneath the scale there when that moves out. So I think this is going to work. Just uh, throw all this stuff into a drawing, take it over to the lathe, and make the parts. This is a piece of 1018 mild steel that I found in my scrap bin. This is just a little bit bigger than the 50 millimeter diameter I want for the finished knob. So we'll start by facing off the end, and then I will turn it down to clean it up and bring it to exactly 50 millimeters. The first step on this part for me is always knurling if I can do that because the knurling sometimes goes bad and I'd like to do it first so that I haven't wasted a lot of effort if I need to change plans. This is the Hemingway sensitive knurling tool that I made in a previous video series and I'm putting it on here just slightly overlapping that chamfer. We'll get it lubed up and then get it adjusted and feed it in. Now I'm using the sensitive feed lever on the back to very gradually feed it in. If you take a bite quickly, it's really easy to double track, but I find that if you gradually apply the pressure and gradually squeeze it down to depth, the knurls tend to find their position and synchronize and resist double tracking. So I just stopped it there to confirm that it is indeed cutting cleanly. It is. so. I've got plenty of oil on this. We'll run the lathe nice and slow, engage the feed, and just feed across the knob. And with a single pass, this has formed a very nice knurl. In fact, that is one of the nicest knurls I've ever achieved with this tool. Again, the key is just to feed it in very gently and let it synchronize rather than trying to take a big bite all at once and letting it double track. I'll come back and clean up that chamfer because the edge of it will be slightly rolled by the knurling operation, and then we just need to drill a hole through this thing. This is a multi-fix collet holder that Peter at Pee Wee Tools sent me to try, and 
it's working pretty well. I've traditionally done all my drilling with the tailstock, but I really want to switch over to drilling on the carriage so that I can actually use the feed for drilling operations. And so far, that's looking pretty good. Now with that drill to come back and bore this out, I'm looking for a perfect fit on the head of the screw. I'd like maybe a thou of uh, press fit here, though obviously this is a metric project. I still think that way, a thou of press fit. So I'm converting the numbers in my head. Then we'll come back and part off the knob. Now, I don't really wanna try to part this deep through a 50 millimeter part on this little lathe. So I will just get a groove established and then take it over to the bandsaw and cut it the rest of the way off. To clean up that saw cut, we'll put it back in the three jaw chuck with a little spacer here. This is a spider that I made years ago. Those screws are for spacing it out from the chuck when you have it flipped over the other way, but I just need the three quarter inch depth so I have it flipped with the screws facing out. And I will use some copper to protect the knurled surface from the chuck jaws. Then we'll just come back Face this off, cut a nice clean chamfer on the edge, and then we just need to bore out the pocket for the thrust bearing. I believe it's a 19 millimeter diameter bearing, so I'm cutting this about 19 and a half millimeters just to give me a little bit of clearance. Deburr the edge, and this part is done. The spacer to go under the thrust bearing is even simpler. I just found a gnarly hunk of steel. I think this is a slug that came out of an annular cutter when I was making something else years ago. Just turn it down to shape, drill it through to clear the screw and part it off. I'll deburring and that's done. Well, the whole point of this was to install it on the lathe. So let's install it on the lathe. Take the stock screw out and I do want to check the fit of the spacer, and yeah, that seems just about perfect. It's bearing on the bottom of the counter bore and not on the top surface. Just throw that on the floor there, and we'll pick it up later. I did go ahead and press the screw into the knob, and this was a really simple operation. I just used a one, two, three block, put the screw through it, through the knob, and then just squeeze this in the machine vise on the mill. I didn't drag a camera over there. Sorry, it was a pretty simple operation, and I just... I just did it without you. Drop one of the hardened washers in here for the bearing, and I do wanna lubricate this. For these thrust bearings, I often just use this extreme pressure lube just because I got a tube of it here at the lathe to use for um, tail centers. Just put a little bit in the bottom there. It really does not take much of this stuff. Drop the bearing in, I put a little bit more on top and it'll work its way through the bearing as I use it. With that in there, we'll drop the other hardened washer on top, pick up the spacer off the floor, and put that in here. And that is the whole stack up. And yeah, that turns nice and smooth. That's exactly what I wanted. Just flip this over and install it. Spin that down, and that should be the lock complete, assuming that it works. So with it loose, the carriage moves, with it tight, uh, it needs to be a little bit tighter than that. Yeah, that locks up pretty well. I wasn't really sure how hard it was going to be to lock with the thrust bearing in there. It should be possible to lock it down with only finger pressure, and yeah, that seems to work okay. The lock on this lathe is kind of spongy. At some point, I would like to come back and make it better. Because ultimately it's the pressure on the ways on the top that's locking it up. The little tab pressing against the bottom isn't really fixed. It can kind of shift a little bit. So it does feel kind of spongy. I have some ideas to put a flexure in there to actually make that a little bit more rigid. But that'll have to wait for another day. Looks like even with the tail stock up there, there's plenty of room to operate this. I think this is going to be a really handy addition to this lathe. Honestly, I have not used the carriage lock at all because it's inconvenient, and maybe I'll start using it now. Do you need a 3D scanner for a simple project like this? Yes, of course you do. Okay, maybe you don't, but I learned a bunch in the process, and now I have some awesome new skills that I can use for the next project. I really wish I had this when I was putting the Quill DRO on my mill, and I am definitely going to use it when I automate the surface grinder. I don't normally tell you what to do, 
but I think you should definitely subscribe so you don't miss that. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, and if you want to help support the channel, head on over to Patreon and check it out. If you're already a patron, thank you. You make it possible for me to do this. Thank you for watching.